Video games are a lot like magicians in that they use skill, technology, and misdirection to trick people into thinking that what they're seeing is real, and to hide the mechanics of how everything works. Also, sometimes they saw people in half. But while a magician's tricks are all about spectacle, video game tricks are a lot more subtle, using camera angles, animations, the environment, and game systems to subtly manipulate the player. Here are seven of our favorite examples that once you see, you won't be able to unsee in plenty of your favorite games. Enjoy and beware spoilers for the following. So before I go, I'll need you to hand me those notes. All right, all right, take them already. Farewell, Geralt. Or rather, see you soon. The three hardest things to draw are hands, horses, and the philosophical concept of epistemology. That's why so few games contain accurate depictions of epistemology, and why Red Dead Redemption 2 took seven years to make. Presumably. More to the point, human hands are a bloody nightmare, with all the little joints and independent finger movement and opposable thumbs. It's not right, is it? Oh no. Oh, no, now I've looked at them for too long. Ugh, hands are weird. So, depicting the dexterity of human hands is a big job. Is it any surprise then that when a game can go without doing a complex animation of one character, handling an item in their human hands, and then passing that item to another character to hold in their human hands, a game will gratefully seize that shortcut? No, is the answer. Here are the pouches. I found six. Well, that's all of them. Kind of mine. This is among the reasons that when it comes time to hand in a quest item, or collect a quest reward, or otherwise give or receive an in-game item, you'll so frequently see a shot over the shoulder of one character showing the interaction taking place, minus the actual hand part of the handover. This blade's the Reckoner. It saved my arse a fair number of times. Thanks, Chen Finelli. We'll call it even. In some cases, the additional bonus is that the game makers won't have to create an actual model for a single-use quest item or whatnot. I have something for you. It... it's a book. It's a neat and subtle bit of efficiency that no one will notice. Except now you will notice. All the time. I have something for you. Ooh, what's this? Oh, isn't that just the cutest thing? The alternative was putting all the characters in mittens. Oh yeah, yeah, that's better. Much less weird. Damn it, come on. Have you ever wondered why it is that video game characters are always squeezing sideways through tight gaps? And I'm not just talking about Tetris blocks. I'm talking about the thing that you're bound to have noticed in recent games where your character is making their way somewhere only to have to squeeze themselves through a tight gap, usually accompanied by a camera close-up and some dialogue that is as unskippable as it is happening inches away from your face. Listen, getting you involved is the last thing I wanted. I, I'm sorry. It might seem like a recent innovation, but the squeezing through gaps set piece is just the latest in a long line of ways in which developers disguise the fact that the game is loading in the next section. There. It's there. Because loading screens are bad, game makers go to great lengths to make it seem like their game never loads at all, disguising the process by slowing you down to a walk, or making you run around a world tree, or even, in a trick we're all wise to by now, forcing you to ride a slow-moving elevator to the next section of the game. At least no one does that anymore. That's Nintendo. They can get away with it. Still, if you've been playing Jedi Fallen Order recently, now you know why it is that powerful Jedi with supernatural powers spend so much time edging through narrow corridors. Sounds like scrap rats. Creepy. Just passing through, guys. Is there not a force power for this? What are you guys teaching the younglings these days? Are 
you okay? For years, we were blaming our own shocking sense of direction for getting lost in video games. Turns out, we could have been blaming the video games themselves. Result. While some games resort to obtrusive waypoint markers or even some sort of magical summonable arrow to guide you on your way, there are actually clever techniques to subtly nudge you in the right direction without you ever realising you're being told what to do. Which is good because, as a cool rebel, I hate doing what I'm told to do. Just try it. Give me a fiver. Ha! <laughs> no. I'll give you a tenner instead. The developers at Valve are probably the masters of this in their Half-Life and Portal games, ensuring that you spy the exit to an area long before you resort to rubbing up against the walls or jumping down a bottomless chasm. The most straightforward technique is by using lighting to illuminate the path so that it catches your eye in an otherwise darker area. Often the effect is so subtle you barely notice as you play. I wouldn't be surprised if the rebels use this place. Other times it's literally a glowing exit sign. Also works. So, a bit like a moth drawn to a lamp, you're essentially being gently manipulated into aiming directly for the brightest spot in the environment. The difference being that the game is guiding you away from fiery death. What are you doing? It's a pretty simple rule of thumb. Go towards the light. Oh, unless you think you might be dying, in which case, for pity's sake, don't go towards the light. Rest assured though, if the game's well designed enough, you'll be able to negotiate even the most complex environments. We're just sorry to shatter the illusion that you found your way there of your own free will. After all, we can't all be cool rebels like me. Give me another tenner. Ha! <laughs> Hell no, Jane! I'll give you my whole wallet. Do you want my car keys as well? <laughs> Sure, shooting people in video games is cool, but you know what's cooler? Calling for a truce. Wait, sorry, I'm reading that wrong. That should be falling off a roof. That's what's cooler. Because whichever way you slice it, shooting an enemy, then having them take a dramatic tumble off a roof, over a railing, or into a nasty looking pit is ten times cooler than just filling them with ordinary old boring lead, and then they fall down on the floor. Something that games have known before they even went 3D. What you might not have noticed, however, is that in a lot of games, this happens way more often than you'd expect it to. After all, most people's reaction to being shot is to crumple into a heap and die, not dramatically fling themselves over the nearest balcony. But when it looks this cool, nobody's complaining. In several games, however, there are systems working away behind the scenes to ensure that your enemies plummet to their doom as often as possible. The most common technique is setting ledges and railings as ragdoll magnets, so that when an enemy dies and they go all floppy, they are then magnetically attracted to the edge, which triggers an animation of them tipping off into oblivion. You can see this in, amongst others, Half-Life 2, Max Payne 3 and Mafia 3, but most obviously in the Red Dead Redemption series, which loves people falling off high ledges like Dutch Vanderlind loves mangoes. Isn't that right, Dutch? Oh, he fell off a high ledge. Probably should have seen that coming. Charles Standish. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Oh, Oscorp CFO. Wait, you don't think this has anything to do with Lee, do you? Sorry to cook and run. Did, did you just leave your clothes on the kitchen floor? You know what you've never seen in a video game? A 3D character getting painstakingly dressed or undressed with close-up shots of their buttons, zippers and laces. Believe me, I've looked. What you have seen plenty of, on the other hand, is a character in an advanced state of undress disappearing off-screen where they pull on their boots, trousers and jacket while the protagonist of Cyberpunk 2077, in this instance, is kicking it in her cyber undies. Ten seconds to fully dressed! It's gotta be a record. The sight of a character getting their kit on can also be omitted by means of crafty camera work, as with Katarina Swarza's quick change in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Merda. I have to find Mario and rally the troops. My men are in the courtyard. Seven seconds! A new record! There are lots of reasons to avoid ostentatiously displaying a game character don their clothing in real time, such as that would take too long and the world isn't ready for full frontal guilt. The world needs to get with the program bunch of prudes. They've cleared the forests, they're pillaging nearby villages, 
and they'll soon be murdering each other en masse. Why? But the additional benefit, beyond pacing and modesty, is that having the player look away while a character does a costume change saves lots of time and effort on animating some of the most challenging and complicated stuff to animate. Hmm, I wanted to stay with you a little longer. I guess they'll have to wait until next time. <laughs> okay, see you soon! Hey, wait! Not only do you have to show hands and limbs doing all the fiddly dressing stuff, but then there'll be lots of complex fabric deformation as the garments get manipulated. Pixar bigwig Brad Bird once said, when discussing the 3D CGI of The Incredibles, that the most difficult kind of shot to animate was one which simulated realistically dynamic cloth, such as one character grabbing another by the shirt. So no wonder animators aren't wild about having Geralt realistically put on and take off a shirt, like I asked. I know. I'll test and the other northern monarchs are neither the smartest nor the most refined, but they're kings, one of whom we serve. Now every time you see a game fade to black when a character is getting changed, and deploy the universal sound effects for clothes are happening, You can be sure some animator has been saved a buttload of hard work that can be used elsewhere for, I don't know, making people reload guns better. And my mission, meanwhile, to find real-time, high-definition dressing videos continues. Oh wait, no, here they are. Oh no. If you've ever watched a martial arts film and wondered why the bad guys attack the hero one at a time instead of all at once, the answer is because then the movie would be about 90 seconds long, and to be honest, pretty upsetting. The same is true of video games, where a lot of the time henchmen will take the same wait and see approach to trying to kill you, where wait and see is short for wait and see a sword impaling you through the chest because you hung around for ages doing nothing. This isn't because video game henchmen are stupid, although there's an argument to be made, but rather due to a piece of behind-the-scenes trickery known as unit slotting. This is a game development technique that's used to confront players with an overwhelming number of enemies and yet still give them the chance to win. This is done by having a limited number of slots available to enemies to attack you, while the rest just stand around looking threatening or occasionally firing in your general direction. Usually you'll be too busy spinning around the place, countering attacks and doing gun catter to notice, but next time you find yourself taking on a big bunch of baddies, have a look and see if two or three of them are doing all the actual work, while the rest of them jig around on the periphery, trying to make you feel like a badass in a way that we would find patronizing if it wasn't totally working. Yeah, actually, I'm pretty sure the Assassin's Creed games don't do this. I'm just the greatest at Assassin's Creed. What the hell? Arcade racing games need a system to keep all the cars bunched together because apparently crossing the finish line a full 30 seconds before everyone else is no fun. I don't know, it seems pretty fun to me. The winner. According to video game developers though, racing games are better when you're constantly in the thick of the action for the entire race, and there's a sneaky trick that can be employed to ensure that's the case. Rubber banding. Too slow, La Katrina. You lose. Surprisingly, it's called rubber banding because the cars spring either towards or away from you as if connected by a rubber band, and not just because it's exactly as annoying as being hit in the face with a rubber band. Hmm. You know, I really thought we'd end up demonstrating that somehow. Ah! Done properly, rubber banding can be brilliant, keeping you dicing with opponents throughout the entire race and ensuring a properly dramatic finale. More often than not, though, it's used to halt your progression until you've ground out the necessary upgrades, and you end up battling against a rival that has the seemingly physics-defying ability to drive away from you. That car is literally from 1971. It should be by the side of the road, making a horrible noise, and failing to start. 
What you'll quickly realise is that pretty much every racing game aside from the really hardcore simulators uses rubber banding to a greater or lesser extent. The crew, for example, uses it to rigidly enforce its MMO-style progression system and keep you grinding for tens of hours, and Sega arcade games like Daytona USA and Sega Rally famously even used it in multiplayer races to keep the racing close. And that, my friends, is rubber banding. Hey, well, thank you for watching this whole video right through to the end as a special treat. For sticking around, I'm going to tell you all about Show of the Week, which you should check out. There's new and exciting things happening in the world of Show of the Week. What new and exciting things? I don't even know. If you don't know, you should click on it and find out. Uh, but what's the same as it ever was is Show of the Weekend, which is down here. So you can check that out. There's like new and scary and old and familiar. There's the two flavors. So help yourself, see which one you like.